Applying laws across time, disentangling the always speaking principles. Martin David Kelly, Oxford Journal of Legal Studies, published the 10th of May, 2024. Abstract. Common law judges frequently claim to apply the always speaking principle, but they recognize that they are not clear on what it means, with Lord Leggett recently calling the metaphor enigmatic. In this article, I seek to clarify this by showing that the always speaking metaphor is associated with at least four different types of principle, each of which responds to a distinct issue, although there is a common theme, change over time. I explore the origins of the always speaking metaphor, distinguish the four issues and explain how they relate. I argue that it is important to disentangle the four types of always speaking principle, with a focus on distinguishing principles of dynamic versus originalist interpretation from principles that empower judges to strain or recast legislation to deal with new developments sensibly. In doing so, I analyze and critique the judgments in the recent UK Supreme Court case of News Corporation. 1. Introduction. For Lord Stain, it is of constitutional significance that legislation is always speaking point one, but many lawyers have never even heard of this metaphor, and it is often misunderstood. The phrase always speaking appears in decisions across the common law world, including in no fewer than six UK Supreme Court decisions between March 2020 and April 2020 on a point two Lord Burroughs has claimed that, although it is trite law that, at least in general, statute is always speaking, what this precisely means is open to debate, and Lord Leggett agreed, in the recent News Corp case, adding that the metaphor is arresting but enigmatic point three. In this article, I argue that the always speaking metaphor seems enigmatic because it is associated with at least four different types of legal principle, for each addresses a distinct issue, albeit with a common thread, the relation between legislation and change over time. These four issues arise for utterances, i.e. uses of language, whether oral or written, generally, not just for legal utterances, and so I frame them here in general terms. Operation issue, at which time, s, is an utterance operative. Meaning issue, by reference to which time, s, is the meaning of an utterance determined. Novelty issue, does an utterance apply to things not known stroke foreseen when it was made. Implicit modification issue, does an utterance implicitly modify an earlier utterance. The conflation of these issues has led to flawed decisions in numerous cases across many jurisdictions, with judges giving the wrong reasons to justify their decision and or arriving at an incorrect decision. 5. In this article, I highlight the key differences between these issues, and show why they make it problematic to label our responses to all of them, the always speaking principle. I then illustrate the problem by analyzing the judgments in News Corp, criticizing the leading judgment of Lords Hamblin and Burroughs for conflating these issues, and praising Lord Leggett's concurring judgment. I begin with the operation issue, which is the one that the metaphor was coined to address, and the only one for which it makes sense. 2. The operation issue. E types of utterance. Many of our utterances are intended to apply to the world, so, to assess whether they apply to a given set of facts, we need to know the time, s, at which they are operative. Some utterances are directed only to the facts at the moment when the utterance was made. If I say that the sky is beautiful, then I claim only that it is beautiful at that specific time. Maybe it was beautiful for only a fleeting moment. Let us call such utterances momentary. Other utterances are intended to be operative across a period of time. If I say to my students, you may ask me questions before your exam, then this is to apply for an extended time, from that point onwards, until the exam commences. Let us call these extended utterances and if I advise my students to always treat people with respect, then this is to be operative on an ongoing basis, indefinitely. It is this type of utterance that we call always speaking. I signaled this linguistically by using the word always, but I could instead have said never treat anyone with disrespect, or even just said be respectful to people, and thereby left the students to infer from the context. That my advice is to be treated as ongoing. Other utterances have a more complex relationship to time. To say that students who fail the exam must do the research, I should, strictly, say, if you shall have failed the exam then you shall be required to do the research. Using the future tense, shall be, 
indicates that the reset at T3 is after my utterance at T1, and using the future perfect tense shall have indicates that failing the exam, T2 comes after my utterance at T1, but before the reset at T3. But we need not follow these grammatical rules strictly. The order of these events in time is obvious, so I can just say if you fail the exam then you must do the reset, using the present tense for both verbs, fail and do, and let the context do the temporal sorting, be present tense drafting. The always speaking metaphor was pioneered by George Coog in the 1840s to show when we can and should use the present tense for future events. Six Coog noticed that legislative drafters were reluctant to do so. And this was leading to torturously drafted clauses such as I, if a person shall be convicted of, and if he shall have been before convicted of the same offence, and if he shall not have undergone the punishment which he should have undergone for the offence of which he shall have been so before convicted. 7. This clause could be written much less awkwardly as, if a person is convicted of, and if he has been convicted of the same offence, and if he has not undergone the punishment which he should have undergone for the offence of which he was convicted. 8. For Coog, statutes not only can but should be written like this, using present and past, Tense drafting makes legislation shorter and more easily understood. But Kud noted that, it is supposed sometimes that it is necessary to, use, the future or perfect future, for fear that if it were expressed in the present tense, as when any person is aggrieved, the law would operate only upon cases existing at the moment of the passing of the act. Or that if it were expressed when any person has been convicted, the law would be retrospective and apply only to convictions previous to the passing of the Act. 9. But, for Coud, these fears were entirely founded on a mistake, and, if the law be regarded while it remains in force as constantly speaking, we get a clear and simple rule of expression, that laws should be drafted to describe facts concurrent with its operation, as if they were present facts, and facts precedent to its operation, as if they were past facts. Point one zero. Kud's approach has been very influential, and laws are now routinely drafted in this way. Kud did not explain why he thought the phrase always speaking is apt to capture this, but consider no exit sign above a door. Surely, this does not speak only to those who happened to be present when it was first installed. It is not a momentary utterance. Instead, it speaks to everyone who approaches that door, on an ongoing basis, indefinitely. And, as one may, in theory, seek to exit by that door at any time, it needs to be always speaking. Now, of course, a sign does not literally speak. 11. But imagine that the door is in a building frequented by blind people, and it is decided to install a sound system, next to the door, that will play a recording of someone saying no exit. This auditory sign would not achieve its purpose if it were to play the recording only once. Instead, the recording must be played on a continuous loop. It needs to be always speaking the words no exit. This analysis of what we might call the temporal application profiles of these different types of utterance helps us to understand the time, s, at which our laws are to be operative. For our laws are typically not momentary, and a great many of them are always speaking. See laws and the operation issue. Laws are usually intended to be operative, and thus to guide our behavior, on an ongoing basis, or, at least, continuously for an extended time. This is particularly true of legislation, as its purpose is typically to create general norms that are to apply to anyone who comes to satisfy, into the indefinite future, a specified description. For example, the offense of handling stolen goods applies not only to those who happen to be handling stolen goods at the moment when it came into force. Instead, it also applies to everyone who subsequently handles stolen goods, indefinitely, unless and until repealed. Most legislative provisions are either always speaking or are ancillary to an always speaking provision, but statutes are just one kind of legal device that involves always speaking utterances. For example, constitutions grant standing permissions and impose ongoing obligations that typically operate indefinitely, as do many international treaties. Leases are also often of indefinite duration, whether formally if terminable only by notice, or in practical terms, a 999-year leases, and they contain ongoing permissions, prohibitions, eggers to use, and obligations, 
to repair ETC, consumer services contracts, egg for broadband or streaming services, are also typically indefinite, operating until they are terminated, and include ongoing obligations, most importantly, to provide the relevant services, and so on. But not all lawmaking utterances, nor even all legislative ones, are always speaking. Some are momentary. Their operation stroke application is exhausted when they are spoken. Point one two compare a statute affecting a divorce with one granting a couple permission to marry. 13. The permission is always speaking. The couple may marry at any time after it comes into force. But divorce is a one-off change in legal status. It occurs at a particular moment, and the operative provision then has no further application. If an act identifies those who are being divorced by using a description, rather than by naming them, then it may be unclear whether it is momentary or always speaking, as in this tale recounted by Robert Megary. W. Hen divorce in the modern sense was possible only by act of parliament. An unhappily married town clerk was promoting a waterworks bill for his town, and in clause 64, mingled with something technical, appeared the innocent little phrase and the town clerk's marriage is hereby dissolved. Nobody could explain how the words got there. And, in fact, nobody ever noticed them while the bill was going through Parliament. T. He royal assent was given, and the town clerk lived happily ever after. At a ripe old age he died, still in harness, and the successor had to be found. The question then arose whether this particular provision was personal to the deceased town clerk. 14. This clause surely applies only to this particular, crafty, town clerk. Parliament used this definite description the town's clerk, referentially, to refer to a particular person, rather than to cover everyone who comes to satisfy that description, so this provision was surely momentary, it would not affect the divorce of every future town clerk, indefinitely, its application was exhausted when it came into force, it is not always speaking, other momentary legislation includes acts that granted amnesty for past offences, egg the act of oblivion 1660, which pardon crimes committed during the English Civil War, an act of attainder, which convicted a named individual of a specified criminal offence. In these examples, the whole act, not just the operative provision, might be momentary. This may partly explain why Lord Steyne, in what was, at least until News Corp, the leading UK decision on the always speaking notion burst out, said that statutes will generally be found to be of the always speaking variety, instead of statutory provisions, 15 but statutes typically contain both momentary provisions and always speaking provisions. In fact, most momentary legislative provisions are far more mundane than acts of divorce, oblivion, or retainder. Many simply amend or repeal other legislation. A statutory provision is amended at the moment when the amending legislation comes into force, and the provision that does the amending thereby stops being operative and similarly with repeal. These references to legislation coming into force highlight, for lawmaking utterances, an important distinction between speaking simpliciter and speaking legally stroke systemically. 16. This reflects a distinction, standard in speech act theory, between content and force. 17. Legislation illustrates this very clearly because, at least in the UK, legislation frequently does not actually come into force when it is enacted. When its content is first expressed, point one eight, the handling offence is a good example. It was enacted on the 26th of July, 1968, but it did not come into force until the 1st of January, 1916. When it was enacted, Parliament spoke, it said something, i.e. expressed a content, but it did not legally speak. It did not create a norm until the later time when it came into force. 20. The handling offence became operative only from that time, and it continues to be operative today, it is always speaking, in the first, an authentic, sense of operating continuously, but only from when it came into force. This content stroke force distinction will be important when we examine, in section 6, how our four issues relate. To summarize, it makes sense to use the always speaking label for a response to the operation issue, we can think of an utterance that is to operate on an ongoing basis as always speaking to us, constantly telling us what we are allowed or required to do, or prohibited from doing. And this reflects the origin of the metaphor in Kut's work on present tense drafting, 21. However, from around the late 1960s onwards, 
the always speaking metaphor came to be confused with our other three issues, starting with the meaning issue. Three, the meaning issue. The meaning issue concerns the time, s, by reference to which the meaning of an utterance is to be determined. There are two main approaches to it. One is that the meaning of an utterance is fixed at the time it was made, i.e. that it has and retains its original meaning. The other is that its meanings are fixed at the times by reference to which it is applied, that it has its current meaning. Point two to these approaches are described using various metaphors. The former is often called the historical approach, the fixed meaning canon or the original meaning rule, or just originalism, and the metaphor here is of the meaning being fixed, frozen, ossified, or static point two three for the latter. The metaphor is of the meaning being mobile, and it is often called dynamic or ambulatory interpretation, the living tree approach, or, and here is the problem, the always speaking principle point two four indeed. This last phrase is now most often used as a label for dynamic or ambulatory interpretation. One of the many pieces of legislation that exemplify a mobile meaning is the subject of an important set of cases, the family member cases, about whether people who stand in particular kinds of relationship count as family. For the purposes of tenancy legislation first enacted in 1920, this legislation was designed to prevent a family losing their home when the name tenant dies by entitling a person who was a member of the tenant's family and who was living with the tenant at the time of death to succeed to the tenancy. The courts held that unmarried heterosexual couples could not be family as at 1949, then that they could be family as at 1961, and then that homosexual couples could be family as at 1994.25. The meaning issue, as with the operation issue, often arises for non-legal utterances. A famous example of static linguistic meaning is Queen Anne reportedly saying in 1707 of the newly built St. Paul's Cathedral in London that it is awful, artificial, and amusing. Point two six. the linguistic meaning of those three adjectives has changed radically since 1707. Awful meant or inspiring artificial meant highly artistic, and amusing meant thought-provoking. Clearly, Queen Anne's words must be understood with their meaning at the time she spoke, else we might take her to have criticized the cathedral when she was actually praising it. But this was a momentary utterance, it expressed her opinion as at that moment in time, and it was not meant to be operative at any future time, never mind on an ongoing basis. Point two seven. Contrast my advice to always treat people with respect. If what counts as respecting someone has changed since I gave that advice, then, to comply with it, my students would, at least in theory, need to determine whether they must do what would have counted, at the time when I gave this advice, as being respectful, or whether they should, instead, do what would today count as being respectful. 28. I would likely have wanted the content of my advice to reflect changes in the ways that we show each other respect. This is often the case for always speaking utterances. When we say something that is to be operative into the indefinite future, it usually makes sense that its content should adjust to reflect the future contexts in which it will fall to be applied. So there is a natural link between always speaking utterances and dynamic or ambulatory interpretation, and this may partly explain why the latter has come to be labeled the always speaking principle. But the meaning issue is clearly different from the operation issue. 29. One key difference is that Whilst it is a speech act that can be always speaking, it is users of words and phrases in those speech acts that can have a static or mobile meaning. In a single utterance, I may want my use of one word, respect, to be mobile in meaning but my use of another word, treat, to be static. So the meaning issue is more fine-grained than the operation issue. An example of an always speaking utterance, in which a key term should be treated as static in meaning, is the old adage, serve red wine at room temperature. This originally meant serve red wine at around 15 to 16 degrees Celsius, 60 degrees Fahrenheit, which was then the relevant average room temperature, and is also the optimal temperature for serving most red wines. But, at least in the UK, average room temperatures are now approximately 20 to 21 degrees Celsius, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Thus, many who try to follow this advice are now serving their red wines too warm, room temperature in this context is to be understood by reference to the original time 
where this always speaking utterance was first used, and not the current time, i.e. when we serve the wine. So the mere fact that an utterance is intended to operate in future situations, that its application is mobile, does not entail that its meaning is to change over time. Thus, it is important to hold separate two distinct questions, i. is the utterance always speaking, in the authentic sense that it operates on an ongoing basis, and two, if so, does it say the same thing each time it speaks, or, instead, might what it says change over time? For an utterance to say something different from what it originally said, it is necessary that it is not momentary, and it will often be always speaking, in the authentic sense, point three zero. But it does not follow that this is sufficient for it to be able to change in meaning over time, that would be to confuse a necessary condition with a sufficient condition, 31 the fact that, in making an always speaking utterance, we usually want some of its terms to be understood with a mobile meaning might explain why the always speaking metaphor has come to be used as a label for dynamic, or ambulatory, interpretation, but this is a mistake nonetheless, the operation and meaning issues also differ in how controversial they are, and in how the principles that we adopt in response to them may be justified. Presuming that legislation is operative into the indefinite future is not controversial. It is usually intended to be always speaking in this first, and authentic, sense, and, if not, then the presumption is rebutted. 32 But how best to address the meaning issue can be very controversial. It is most controversial for constitutions rather than statutes, particularly in the United States, where originalism currently has much academic and judicial support, but support for originalism is not limited to the United States, or to constitutions. Point three three. the current UK position, is that legislative meaning is presumed to be capable of changing over time. This stance is justified on the basis that the original enacting parliament intended that its meaning may change, and so the presumption is rebuttable by ascribing to that parliament a contrary intention. 34. Therefore, the main justification for this type of always speaking principle is parliamentary sovereignty. However, responses to the novelty issue may challenge parliamentary sovereignty. 4. The novelty issue. The novelty issue concerns how an utterance should apply to something novel, in the sense that it was not known to, understood by, or foreseen by the producer of that utterance. 35. Since the producer did not, by definition, consider the novelty when they chose their words, it will be, at least partly, arbitrary whether the novelty falls within the content expressed by uttering those words. Often, we will get lucky, this partly arbitrary outcome will be fine. However, in at least some cases, this would generate an unsatisfactory outcome. The wine example illustrates this nicely. The change in average room temperatures is novel, and it was presumably not known to, or foreseen by, the original producer of the advice, otherwise they would likely have worded it differently. If we want to follow this advice, what should we do? 36 are we to serve our red wine at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, thereby generating unsatisfactory outcomes, i.e. overly warm red wine, or should we recast the advice, treat it as if it were worded differently, say, as serve red wine at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, to generate better outcomes. 37. In all but very rare contexts, legislation is designed to apply to at least some novelties. For example, it is a crime, in England and Wales, to handle stolen laptops, even though laptops did not exist in 1968, when the handling offence was enacted. Point three eight no one seriously suggests otherwise, although this point is often confused in the debates over originalism. Point three nine, but this is not a complete response to the novelty issue, we still need to determine which novelties a legislative provision applies to. According to one approach, the meaning should do all the work here, and we should simply let novelties lie where they, linguistically, fall. If things not known or understood at the time an act came into force fall, on a fair construction, within its words, those things should be held to be included. Point four zero. So, as the act says goods, and laptops are goods, it follows that handling stolen laptops is an offence, that generates a satisfactory outcome. But we will not always be so lucky, think of what counts, or may, in the future, count, as arms for the purposes of the US Constitution's Second Amendment.
and the worse the outcome of applying the apparent meaning, the more acute the problem. This problem is lessened somewhat by the fact that novelties often lead to changes in our language, and thus we can sometimes resolve the novelty issue by applying the current meaning. Inventions often lead to linguistic changes. The word laptop cannot by definition appear in pre-coinage utterances, but inventions also influence our use of existing concept terms. For example, Victor Chandler 1999, concerned whether teletext pages, invented in 1970, are a document for the purposes of legislation, first enacted in 1952, regulating adverts, 41 the growth of E. Communications has greatly changed how we use the word document.42. However, in many other cases, the legislative meaning has changed since enactment, perhaps even markedly so, but not in the right way, or not markedly enough. Point four three, for example, the family member cases section 3 involve a change in meaning. As new living arrangements emerged, and as social attitudes towards them altered, the word family developed a broader meaning. This enabled a bare majority of the House of Lords to hold, in Fitzpatrick, that a long-term cohabiting gay couple were members of each other's family. Counsel for Mr. Fitzpatrick had implicitly conceded that the original 1920 meaning of the legislation did not include gay couples, but the majority held that family here should be given its current 1994 meaning, which, in their view, covered this relationship, and, as the majority considered that this was a satisfactory outcome, they did not, strictly, need to decide whether there was a novelty, and, if so, what that novelty was point four four. This extending, or reproposing, of our existing concept terms is also evident where the novelty is an advance in our understanding. A good example is Burstown Section 2C, which concerned appeals by two defendants, who, by stalking their victims, had caused them to suffer anxiety and depression against convictions for bodily harm offences under an 1861 Act. 45. The defendants argued that bodily harm must be understood as it was in 1861, when psychiatric harm was not considered to be bodily, but the House of Lords unanimously held, in purported application of the always speaking rule, that bodily harm, as used in the 1861 Act, should be given its current meaning, and, as this included recognizable psychiatric illness, the Lords upheld the convictions, 46 I will say more about Burstow in section 7b, 2, the key point here is that the novelty, unforeseen advances in medical understanding, especially the connection between mental illness and the brain, as a part of the body, had, by the 1990s, become reflected in the meaning of bodily in a way that enabled the lords to reach an outcome that they considered to be satisfactory by giving the legislation its current 1990s, rather than its original Victorian era, meaning. These examples show a close connection between the meaning and novelty issues, and this may partly explain why the always speaking label has come to be used for the novelty issue. But this close connection should not obscure the fact that the two issues are importantly different. 47. It is true that, in some cases, our response to the meaning issue may happen to neutralize the novelty issue in that case, by, luckily, preventing what would otherwise have been an unsatisfactory outcome. But this is certainly not true of all cases involving novelties. If the current meaning does not help us, we might reach a better outcome by straining the legislative meaning. We usually determine that meaning partly by considering the purposes of the legislation and the consequences of adopting various proposed interpretations of it, and we may be tempted to strain the meaning somewhat to align our decision more closely with those purposes in order to generate better consequences. Thus, there is a wide range of possible responses to the novelty issue, depending on just how much straining is permitted. But there are some cases in which the novelty cannot be brought within even a highly strained meaning, whether original or current. The question is then, should we recast the legislation, treat it as if it were worded differently, to generate a better outcome? A good example is the Leading UK case on the novelty issue, Royal College of Nursing, which concerned a 1967 act that partially legalized abortion by creating an exception for when a pregnancy is terminated by a doctor under specified conditions. 48 in 1967, abortions were all performed surgically, but in 1971, a new method, medical induction, 
was invented and, as it is superior to surgical methods, it quickly became dominant. Medical inductions involved administering the drug prostaglandin intravenously, over 18 to 30 hours, and, in practice, this was done by nurses, albeit as directed by and supervised by a doctor, were the nurses acting legally in performing medical inductions. The question here was not whether to give the provision its original or current meaning. No one suggested that its meaning had changed in any material respect since 1967, nor would straining that meaning suffice to make medical inductions legal. A pregnancy terminated by nurses is simply not one terminated by a doctor, just as a portrait painted by an artist working in Rembrandt's studio, even if it was painted at Rembrandt's direction, and under his supervision, was not painted by Rembrandt. The problem, instead, was that I, medical inductions were not contemplated by the 1967 Parliament when it chose which words to enact. Two, the words it chose simply do not cover them. And three, if this novelty was allowed to lie where it fell, then two seriously undesirable consequences would follow. First, abortions would either have to be performed surgically, with a much higher risk to the pregnant woman or medical inductions would have to be performed by a doctor, which would be a heinous waste of resources, at least until new legislation addressed the novelty differently. Second, the tens, or even hundreds, of thousands of nurses who had performed medical inductions, over a period of almost a decade, had all committed serious criminal offences. This case generated much judicial disagreement. In the High Court, Wolf J. held that the nurses were acting lawfully, but the Court of Appeal unanimously reversed that decision. For Brighton L.J., it would be a misuse of language to describe these terminations as done by a doctor for Lord Denning, Mr. They would be legal only if the continuous act of administering prostaglandin was done by the doctor personally and for Baker J., although their decision may result in a safe and easy method being less used, with consequent hardship or even greater danger to pregnant women. A judge is not entitled to read an act differently from what it says simply because he thinks Parliament would have so provided had the situation been envisaged at that time. Point four nine, the House of Lords, by a bare majority, reversed the Court of Appeals decision. But Lord Wilberforce, dissenting, said of the majority's opinion that this is not construction, it is rewriting, and the other dissenter described it as redrafting with a vengeance.50 in our terms. The legislation was recast by the majority. I will say more about this case in section 7b. I. The key point here is that the meaning and novelty issues are importantly different. The former concerns the time by reference to which the meaning of legislation is determined, and the latter concerns how legislation should deal with things or situations that were not known to, or foreseen by, the parliament that enacted it. Our responses to the meaning and novelty issues are also justified differently. Dynamic interpretation is usually justified via parliamentary sovereignty. When we treat legislative meaning as mobile, we do so because we take the enacting parliament to have instructed us to do so, albeit implicitly. But when judges strain or, especially, recast legislation, this may challenge that sovereignty as it is what the legislature instructed us to do, what it meant by the words that it chose to enact, that is the problem. This raises important separation of powers issues. If a court gives legislation its current meaning because that is what the original enacting parliament instructed, this is not only consistent with but required by the court's role as a faithful agent of the legislature, but when a court recasts legislation, it exercises an interstitial quasi-legislative power to change that legislation. This raises serious concerns about democratically illegitimate and unaccountable judicial power. 51. The meaning and novelty issues also differ as to the key rule of law value of fair notice. The purpose of legislation is usually to guide our conduct and to achieve that purpose and for sanctions for non-compliance to be justified, we must have fair notice of its content, of what it permits or requires us to do or prohibits us from doing. This may be achieved under either an original meaning or a current meaning approach, although fair notice considerations slightly favor the latter. 52 But if a court recasts legislation to deal with a novelty more satisfactorily, that might be unfair to those who relied on the apparent meaning of that legislation in organizing their affairs. Such considerations led Lord Simon to conclude that, 
in a society living under the rule of law. Those who are subject to the law are entitled to regulate their conduct according to what a statute has said, rather than by what it would have otherwise said if a newly considered situation had been envisaged. Point five three. This fair notice problem is exacerbated by the lack of guidance on when courts will exercise this quasi-legislative power. Evelyn Ellis has claimed, regarding whether courts will read legislation in the way in which they believe Parliament would have wished to phrase it in order to achieve its desired end, had Parliament known of later developments, that it is well nigh impossible to predict when the judiciary will be daring enough to treat legislation as if it had been amended. Point five four. This leaves those who seek to comply with the piece of legislation in a quandary, can they rely on the apparent meaning of that legislation, or should they try to predict whether or not a court would be willing to recast it? A related difference between the meaning and novelty issues concerns the retrospectivity of recasting legislation. The power to amend statutes is usually reserved to the legislature not only because it, uniquely, is democratically legitimate and accountable, but also because only the legislature can amend legislation with exclusively prospective effect or with transitional provisions to protect legitimate expectations. But court decisions are almost always fully retrospective in their effect. Their main function is to resolve disputes about past events. And if they were not retrospective, they would be unable to fulfill that function. 55. These fundamental issues have led to strident objections to any judicial power to recast legislation. It has been described as unacceptably speculative and potentially perilous. Point five six judges often, and perhaps understandably, downplay their law, making powers, at least in areas of law that are governed by legislation. They rarely acknowledge that they have recast legislation, and tend instead to present their decisions as being mere interpretations. But although there is no bright line that separates, I, adopting a tenable though strained, interpretation of legislation from, two, recasting that legislation, it does not follow that there is no difference between them. And there are several clear cases of recasting. 57. The question of whether judges should strain or recast legislation to address the novelty issue arises only because the legislature has not enacted fresh legislation to deal with the novelty directly. Our fourth issue implicit modification also concerns how to deal with a novelty but this time the novelty is itself new legislation enacted by the same legislature five the implicit modification issue the legislature that enacted a piece of legislation usually has the power uniquely to repeal or amend it by enacting new legislation point five eight typically it does so explicitly by declaring that the existing legislation is repealed or specifying how it is amended, but sometimes a legislature does not fully address how its new enactment interacts with existing legislation, and so a question may arise as to whether it has modified existing legislation implicitly. This issue is also a general one, returning to our always treat people with respect example. Imagine that I later tell the same students to always do what you think is right. Those pieces of advice may come into conflict in some situations, and, if they wish to follow them, my students might need to decide how they interact. I could have modified my first advice explicitly, egg by saying always do what you think is right, even if that involves disrespecting someone, but I did not do this, and so they must decide whether I modified it implicitly. This conflict arose because I gave them some more recent advice, and we usually treat our later selves as authoritative over our past selves. Hence, it seems natural to resolve the conflict by determining what I meant by my latest piece of advice. 59. A good legal example is the Oxfordshire case, which concerned whether 1965 legislation that enacted a startlingly wide definition of town or village green had implicitly modified the scope of Victorian era provisions that also used that phrase, but without defining it. Point six zero. The question was not whether the meaning of these earlier acts had changed simply through the passage of time, and, while the 1965 Act was a novelty, as it was not known to, or foreseen by, the earlier parliaments, it arose from further legislation by the same legislature. Thus, the question was, what should we take the later, 1965, Parliament to have intended, regarding the earlier, 1800s, legislation, in enacting those words? So, 
Whereas the novelty issue concerns whether the old legislation deals adequately with a novelty, and, if not, whether to strain or recast it, the implicit modification issue turns on the new legislation. There are good reasons for having a general principle that allows implicit modification. Legislative drafters, especially in jurisdictions with large statute books, cannot be expected to identify every provision that their bill may affect and explicitly modify them all. This is a counsel of perfection. Inevitably, even the most gifted drafter will miss some interactions, and judges should be able to deal with these situations sensibly, as judges can do so by ascribing to the later legislature an intention regarding the earlier legislation. This is largely just orthodox statutory interpretation and is thus consistent with parliamentary sovereignty. However, it is problematic to bring such principles under the always speaking label, 61. This compounds the mistake of extending that label from the meaning issue to the novelty issue, and, of course, it was a mistake to extend it to the meaning issue in the first place, but it also fails to recognize that new legislation, enacted by the same legislature, is a special kind of novelty. This has led to several incorrectly reasoned decisions, with judges resolving the implicit modification issue according to the intention of the earlier parliament. 62. 6. Relating the issues, taking stock, I have highlighted several ways in which these four issues relate to each other. First, they arise for utterances generally, not just for lawmaking utterances, such as statutes. Second, they share a broad theme, the relation between utterances and change over time. Third, if an utterance is always speaking, in the first an authentic sense of being operative on an ongoing basis, a response to operation issue, then it is natural to presume that its meaning may change over time, a response to meaning issue. And this may explain why the always speaking label has come to be used for a presumption of dynamic interpretation. It also provides a helpful way of thinking about how the meaning can change over time. Always speaking utterances are to be treated as if they are continually being re-uttered, and as each re-utterance takes place in a new context, it can express a new content, 63 fourth, if an utterance is always speaking in the first and authentic sense, then we may need to decide how that utterance should apply to a new development, i.e. a response either to the novelty issue or, if the novelty is new legislation, to the implicit modification issue. The third and fourth points suggest that legislation must be always speaking in the authentic sense, or, at least, that it must not be momentary for the other issues to arise. It may seem that the meaning issue cannot arise for a momentary provision, if legislation applies only to the facts that obtained at the moment it was enacted, then no later change in meaning can alter how it applied, but things are more complex for the other two issues. Although the producer of an utterance can, by definition, become aware of the novelty only after making the utterance, the novelty itself may exist at the time of utterance, and so the question of whether to strain or revise the utterance to deal with the novelty more satisfactorily, might arise. But such situations will be very rare, and the implicit modification issue might arise for a momentary provision. A later legislature may amend, or repeal, it implicitly. But, as the application of the provision is already exhausted, it is highly unlikely to arise in practice. There is a further caveat. There can be a time gap between enacting a momentary provision and it coming into force. The meaning may change in that time gap, a novelty may arise in it, and the legislation could even be implicitly modified before it comes into force. So, strictly, the operation issue is not logically prior to the other three issues, but any time gap between legislation being enacted and it then coming into force is usually quite short, and this complication is thus unlikely to arise very much in practice. Therefore, in the vast majority of cases, the other three issues arise only for provisions that are not momentary. But even if, in practice, for one of the other three issues to arise, it is usually necessary that the relevant legislation is operative on an ongoing basis, i.e. that it is always speaking in the first and authentic sense. That is not nearly enough to warrant us to use the label the always speaking principle for our responses to any of these other three issues. 64. The meaning issue is, however, logically prior to the novelty issue. The question of whether legislation deals with a novelty satisfactorily can be answered only after identifying its meaning. And, at least in theory, 
that involves deciding between the original and current meaning. To summarize, issues 1 to 3 are, in all but rare cases, sequential. First, we resolve the operation issue, then, if needed, we resolve the meaning issue, and then, if needed, we resolve the novelty issue. This provides us with a decision procedure for novelty issue cases, which I will now illustrate using the recent UK Supreme Court decision in News Corporation. This concerned whether legislation, first enacted in 1972, conferring VAT zero rating on supplies of newspapers applied to digital editions of newspapers, the Supreme Court held, unanimously, that it did not. This clearly involved a novelty. Digital editions were not known to, or foreseen by, the 1972 Parliament that first enacted this valuable tax status. But, under our decision procedure, we should start by asking whether the legislation is always speaking in the first and authentic sense. Was it operative on an ongoing basis? Clearly, it was. Just as VAT was generally to be levied on supplies of goods and services on an ongoing basis, so zero rating was to apply to such supplies, if they met specified criteria. Next, we identify the meaning of the legislation, including, at least in theory, whether it should be given its original 1970s, or its current meaning. Once we have sufficiently identified the legislative meaning, we can then assess whether it would generate a sensible outcome for the novelty, and, if not, whether we should strain or recast it to generate a better outcome. The justices in News Corp may have benefited from following this decision procedure. The leading judgment, jointly given by Lords Hamberlin and Burroughs, discuss the always speaking principle. But it is not fully clear about which of our issues it responds to. Lord Leggett's concurrence, on the other hand, is the best judicial analysis of the always speaking notion to date. He recognized the origins of the always speaking metaphor, includes work on present tense drafting, and correctly distinguished three of our four uses of the always speaking label. But Lords Hamberlin and Burroughs did not directly engage with Lord Leggett's analysis, and they score considerably less well on these points. 7. News Corp. The Hamberlin Burroughs Judgment. A. Defining the always speaking principle. Lords Hamberlin and Burroughs framed the case as a battle between I. The always speaking principle of domestic statutory interpretation, which may be thought to support a wide interpretation, and 2. The EU law requirement to interpret exemptions from VAT strictly and to give effect to a standstill provision. Point six five but they did not even consider whether the relevant legislation was always speaking by ongoing operation. Instead, they recounted the argument of counsel for News Corp that this is a classic example of where an always speaking interpretation is appropriate because it concerned a technological development where the underlying purpose of VAT zero rating carries through to the new development Lords Hamblin and Burroughs considered that this was an attractive submission not least because of its rational simplicity. Point six six. This presents the case as turning on the novelty issue. Lords Hamblin and Burroughs then defined the always speaking principle as follows. A. S. General rule. A statute should be interpreted taking into account changes that have occurred since the statute was enacted. Those changes may include, for example, technological developments, changes in scientific understanding, changes in social attitudes and changes in the law. Exceptionally, the always speaking principle will not be applied where it is clear, from the words used in the light of their context and purpose, that the provision is tied to an historical frozen interpretation. 67. Which of our four issues were Lords Hamblin and Burroughs articulating a response to here? Clearly not the operation issue, they were not saying that statutes are generally operative on an ongoing basis, but this passage seems broad enough to encompass the other three issues, changes in meaning, a novelty emerging and new legislation being enacted, as one type of change in the law, which might implicitly modify existing legislation. Curiously, Lords Hamblin and Burroughs did not explicitly mention changes in meaning, but their claim is a general one, their list of specific types of changes expressly illustrative only, and Lord Burroughs had, in his Hamlin lectures, strongly associated the always speaking metaphor with changes in meaning. It is trite law that, at least in general, a statute is always speaking or, as it has otherwise been expressed, has an ambulatory meaning. Point six eight. Although it covers the meaning issue, 
Lords Hamblin and Burroughs's definition mainly presents the always speaking principle as being about novelties. This is shown by their claim that its great merit is that it operates to prevent statutes becoming outdated given that it would be unrealistic for Parliament to try to keep most statutes up to date by continually passing amendments to cope with subsequent change. Point six nine. This claim makes sense only for a response to the novelty issue. Regarding the meaning issue, it would be absurd to enact new legislation to ensure that statutes which use terms like bodily harm, member of the family and reasonably are kept up to date. How would Parliament even do that? except by constantly reenacting that legislation using exactly the same words. Be the leading cases on the always speaking principle. Lords Hamblin and Burroughs did not disclose the origins of their definition, but they then reviewed five of the leading cases on the always speaking principle. Point seven zero. It is evident, from their selection of these cases, that they have conflated the meaning and novelty issues. Three of the cases concern the novelty issue, but the other two are meaning issue cases. I, Royal College of Nursing. I discuss the first of their cases, Royal College of Nursing, in Section 4. It concerned the legality of abortions performed by medical induction. The tests that Lords Hamblin and Burroughs ultimately applied in News Corp are set out in the Lord Wilberforce's dissenting opinion. In interpreting an act of Parliament it is proper, and indeed necessary, to have regard to the state of affairs existing, and known by Parliament to be existing. At the time, it is a fair presumption that Parliament's policy or intention is directed to that state of affairs. W. N. A new state of affairs, or a fresh set of facts bearing on policy, comes into existence. The courts have to consider whether they fall within the parliamentary intention. They may be held to do so, if they fall within the same genus of facts as those to which the express policy has been formulated, or if there can be detected a clear purpose in the legislation, which can only be fulfilled if the extension is made. 71. Lord Wilberforce's first test here permits at least some straining of the legislative meaning. The genus analogy is vague, but it suggests that fairly specific language, the species part, may be read more broadly, such that it applies to something that is not in the same species, i.e. does not fall within its meaning but is similar enough to it to be within the same genus. How far this permits judges to go in straining the legislative meaning was, perhaps deliberately, left somewhat unclear by Lord Wilberforce. The second test, by contrast, initially appears unconstrained by the legislative meaning. It requires, i, that there is a clear legislative purpose and, 2, that it can only be fulfilled by extending the legislation to the novelty, 72. This looks like a strong purposivist approach to interpretation, but that appearance is deceptive. Lord Wilberforce added that how liberally this test may be applied must depend upon the nature of the enactment, and the strictness or otherwise of the words in which it has been expressed, and also that, because abortion is a controversial subject involving moral and social judgments on which opinions strongly differ, medical induction by nurses should not be sanctioned by judicial decision but only by Parliament after proper consideration of the implications and necessary safeguards. Point seven three. Importantly, Lord Wilberforce also imposed an overriding constraint on these tests. T. Here is one course which the courts cannot take. They cannot fill gaps. They cannot by asking the question what would Parliament have done in this current case, not being one in contemplation, if the facts had been before it, attempt themselves to supply the answer. If the answer is not to be found in the terms of the Act itself, 74. Thus, for Lord Wilberforce, judges must not respond to the novelty issue by adopting a counterfactual approach. They must not seek to determine how the original enacting Parliament would have dealt with the novelty had they known about it. He then opined that the Abortion Act 1967 is not for purposive or liberal or equitable construction, and, as medical inductions performed by nurses were beyond the legislature's fairly expressed authority, they were unlawful. 75 Lord Wilberforce's focus was therefore firmly on the legislative language, on the terms of the Act, and he sought to limit how far courts are permitted to stray from what Parliament had meant by the words it had chosen to enact. For Lords Hamblin and Burroughs, these passages from Lord Wilberforce's opinion stated how the always speaking principle is to be applied. Point seven six, but this gloss is doubtful. At best, the phrase always speaking does not appear in any of the opinions in Royal College of Nursing, 
and it did not make its debut in a reported UK case until 1997.77. They also noted that, although this was a dissenting opinion, the House of Lords subsequently approved it in Quint of All, another of their leading cases on the always speaking principle.78. This gives our story a curious twist. Quint of All, as we shall see, is a clear case of recasting, or, in Lord Wilberforce's terms, rewriting legislation. But, before we analyze Quint of All, we should examine the second of Lords Hamblin and Burroughs's leading cases, Burstow. Two, Burstow. I introduced Burstow in section four. It was resolved by giving the phrase bodily harm in an 1861 act its current meaning, and thus, in light of our improved understanding of the link between the brain, as part of the body and the mind, the phrase covered recognized mental illnesses. So Burstow turned on the meaning issue, there was a novelty, our improved understanding, but this had infused our language such that the case could be resolved through a dynamic interpretation, by giving the key legislative phrase, bodily harm, its current meaning. But Lord Stain's leading opinion did not fully comprehend the always speaking notion. He, rightly, acknowledged its origin, in encouraging the use of present tense drafting in legislation, but he then, wrongly, claimed that this drafting technique, brought about the situation that statutes will generally be found to be of the always speaking variety. Point seven nine. the converse of this is true. The drafting technique of using the present tense for future situations does not cause legislation to be always speaking, rather, it is because legislation is always speaking that we can safely use the present tense for future situations. Lord Stain then held that, I, the crucial issue is whether to apply the current meaning of the statute to present day conditions, or to apply its historical or original meaning. 2. Resolving this is a matter of interpretation. 3. Because statutes are usually intended to operate for many years it would be most inconvenient if courts could never rely on the current meaning of statutes. An. I've. The 1861 Act is of the always speaking type. It must be interpreted in the light of the best current scientific appreciation of the link between the body and psychiatric injury. Point eight zero. Lord Stain thus clearly treated the always speaking principle as a principle of dynamic interpretation, i.e. a response to the meaning issue. But, he then claimed that the Royal College of Nursing decision is an example of an always speaking construction, despite the question of static versus dynamic interpretation not being a live one in that case. 81. 3. Quint of all. Lord Stain showed a better understanding of Royal College of Nursing in the next of Lords Hamblin and Burroughs's five leading cases on the always speaking principle. Quint of all. This concerned a 1990 act that regulated creating and using human embryos, which it defined as a live human embryo where fertilization is complete. Point eight two in 1990, a live human embryo could be created only by fertilization, but then a new method cell nuclear replacement, CNR, enable them to be created otherwise than by fertilization. The key question was whether a CNR embryo is an embryo for the purposes of the 1990 Act. If so, then creating and using CNR embryos would fall within that Act's strict regulatory regime. But, if not, then CNR embryos could be created by anyone and used for any purpose. Placing a human embryo created in this way inside an animal, or using an embryo to create a human clone, without any legal limits, 83 the appellate courts were not willing to countenance these troubling outcomes. The Court of Appeal, and then the House of Lords, unanimously held that a CNR embryo is an embryo for the purposes of the 1990 Act. Quint of all clearly did not concern the meaning issue. No one was suggesting that the meaning of the legislative phrase where fertilization is complete had changed since 1990, and no amount of straining of that meaning would bring CNR embryos within its scope. They clearly fell outside its meaning, as they are simply not fertilized. So the real question was whether to recast this provision, to treat it as if it were worded differently, to avoid the nightmarish outcome that live human CNR embryos were entirely legally unregulated, but Lord Bingham, giving the leading opinion, said, in an oft-quoted passage, that, there is, no inconsistency between the rule that statutory language retains the meaning it had when Parliament used it, and the rule that a statute is always speaking. If Parliament, however long ago, passed an act applicable to dogs, 
It could not properly be interpreted to apply to cats, but it could properly be held to apply to animals which were not regarded as dogs when the act was passed, but are so regarded now, 84. Thus, Lord Bingham took the always speaking rule to be one of dynamic interpretation, 85, but he did not mention the phrase always speaking again, and it is unclear why he made this comment, especially as he then, rightly, treated this as a novelty issue case. Lord Bingham, noting that courts often grapple with the question whether a modern invention or activity falls within old statutory language, and emphasizing the constitutional imperative that the courts stick to their interpretative role, and do not assume the mantle of legislators, then quoted, and purported to apply, the Royal College of Nursing Tests, 86 but Lord Bingham, neglecting Lord Wilberforce's overriding constraint, held that CNR embryos fall within the same genus of facts as fertilized embryos and that, given the clarity of Parliament's purpose, the 1990 Act did cover CNR embryos, 87 this was clearly a recasting of the legislation, Lord Stain, concurring, took a similar approach to Lord Bingham, with whose opinion he expressly agreed. The critical question was whether, in the light of a new scientific development, the parliamentary intent covers the new state of affairs, and Lord Stain then also set out, and purported to apply, Lord Wilberforce's tests in Royal College of Nursing, 88 but, similarly to Lord Bingham, Lord Stain did not apply them with full fidelity. For Lord Stain, this was... A classic case where the new scientific development falls within what Lord Wilberforce called the same genus of facts, and in any event, there is a clear legislative purpose, which can only be fulfilled if an extensive interpretation is adopted. 89. Lord Stain then canvassed two methods of achieving this extension. The first was to treat the words where fertilization is complete as being merely illustrative of the legislative purpose, thus making those words otios. The second was to imply a phrase so that the provision reads a live human embryo where, if it is produced by fertilization, fertilization is complete. Point nine zero. Lord Stain concluded that, if it was necessary to choose between these two methods, he would adopt the former, because it requires no verbal manipulation. Point nine one. But ignoring words is just as much a recasting or rewriting of legislation as implying a phrase into it. Lord Stain's opinion, like, Lord Bingham's, mentioned the always speaking metaphor. Endorsing his own leading opinion in Burstall, Lord Stain contrasted the always speaking approach with historical interpretation, i.e. that legislation must be construed as if one were interpreting it on the day after it was passed, and said that, as the 1990 Act is always speaking, the Act may be construed in the light of contemporary scientific knowledge. Point nine two. Thus, like Lord Bingham, Lord Stain treated the idea that statutes are always speaking as a principle of dynamic interpretation. But, unlike Lord Bingham, Lord Stain rightly noted that dynamic interpretation does not solve the problem with the 1990 Act. 93. Lord Stain did not say why it did not solve the problem, although this is presumably because CNR embryos clearly fell out with even the current legislative meaning. Therefore, Although Lord Bingham and Lord Stain each discuss the always speaking principle in their opinions in Quintable, they each rightly treated it as a novelty issue case. In News Corp, Lords Hamblin and Burroughs did not engage specifically with either Lord Bingham's leading opinion or Lord Stain's concurrence, so they might have missed that neither of them purported to decide Quintable by applying the always speaking principle, and that Lord Stain was explicit that he was not deciding the case by applying it. I've Owens. The fourth of Lords Hamblin and Burroughs as leading cases concerned the meaning issue. Owens turned on legislation, first enacted in 1969, that enabled divorce where a person's behavior is such that their spouse cannot reasonably be expected to live with them. 94 unreasonable behavior in a marriage was certainly not a new development, but the major changes in social attitudes towards women since 1969 were presumably not foreseen by the 1969 Parliament, and so they count as a novelty. For example, in 1970 a judge held that a husband was not in any sense culpable when he used force against his wife in attempting to have sex with her, a decision that, in 2018, Lord Wilson in the UK Supreme Court, described as inconceivable today, 95 but, as was the case with Burstall, the relevant change had become reflected in our language, our use, in this context. 
off the word reasonably, such that the courts could apply our current standards of tolerable marital behavior, just by giving the relevant legislation its current meaning, without needing to strain or recast it, as Mun BP put it in the Court of Appeal. The behavior of spouses must be judged by t he standards of the reasonable man or woman on the Clapham omnibus, not the man on the horse-drawn omnibus in Victorian times, not the man or woman on the Routermaster clutching their paper bus ticket in October 1969, when the 1969 Act received royal assent, but the man or woman on the Boris bus, with their Oyster card in 2017.96. So, of the first four of what Lords Hamblin and Burroughs took to be the leading cases on the always speaking principle, two are novelty issue cases and two are meaning issue cases. The operation issue was not contentious in any of them. The relevant legislation was all clearly always speaking in the first and authentic sense, i.e. operative on an ongoing basis. V. FII Glow, their fifth case, FII Glow, returns us to the novelty issue, this time, the new development was an unforeseen change in the law. Legislation first enacted in 1939 established a special limitation period for actions for relief from the consequences of a mistake. Before 1998, such actions were possible for mistakes of fact only. But then the House of Lords changed the common law by allowing actions for mistakes of law and held that the special limitation period covers them. 97 The question on which the Supreme Court divided 4-3 was whether the Lords were correct on this limitation point. The majority and dissenting judgments analyze this in terms of whether the legislation is always speaking. Lords Reed and Hodge, for the majority, made some progress in disentangling the always speaking principles. They said that this somewhat vague expression is commonly used in connection with statutory terms which change in their connotations over time. And they discussed Fitzpatrick and Burstow, two meaning issue cases. Point nine eight, but Lords Reed and Hodge then discussed Royal College of Nursing, Victor Chandler and Quintivall, three novelty issue cases, prefacing this discussion with the comment that the always speaking principle is also invoked where the question arises whether a statutory expression should be interpreted as including a novel invention or activity, which does not naturally fall within its meaning, and was not envisaged at the time of its enactment but may nevertheless fall within the scope of its original intention. 99. Lords Reed and Hodge also noted, rightly, that FII differs from those three novelty issue cases in that they each concerned a novelty that fell out with the legislative meaning, and so the question was whether to extend the legislation to include it, whereas the novelty in FII felt squarely within the legislative meaning, and so the question in FII was whether to narrow the legislation to exclude it, but this led them, wrongly, to doubt whether the always speaking principle is relevant, although they concluded that it ultimately does not matter because it boils down to the same issue. What is the construction of the provision which best gives effect to the policy of a statute? 100 that Lords Reed and Hodge did not recognize that this type of always speaking principle, i.e. response to the novelty issue, governed FII may partly explain why they did not set out or purport to apply. Lord Wilberforce's tests from Royal College of Nursing, the joint dissenting judgment of Lords Briggs and Sales did much better on this score. They considered it was helpful and appropriate to view the case through the prism of the doctrine that statutes are to be taken to be always speaking, but then added, curiously, that nothing really turns on this point. 101 Lords Briggs and Sales then opined that the always speaking principle concerns whether Parliament can be taken to have intended by legislation passed at one point in time, using language directed to the circumstances at that time, to cover a new set of circumstances which has come into existence since then, i.e. they clearly took the always speaking principle to be a response to the novelty issue, and they set out Lord Wilberforce's tests from Royal College of Nursing, 102 but, Lords, Briggs and Sales then presented their application of those tests as an interpretation of the Act, the word mistake cannot, on a purposive construction, be construed to apply to mistake of law claims, when, clearly, this was a recasting of the legislation, treating it as if it were worded differently, to generate what they took to be a better outcome for the novelty, 103, for Lords Hamblin and Burroughs. The decision of the majority in FII can be viewed as an application of the always-speaking doctrine, 
as it held that the best interpretation of the act should apply the purpose of the provision to the present, not the past, state of the law.104. It is not fully clear what Lords Hamblin and Burroughs meant by this, but it seems to treat the always speaking principle as a principle of dynamic interpretation rather than as a response to the novelty issue. However, FII was not resolved by giving the act its current meaning. The legislation just said mistake, and mistakes of law have been mistakes throughout. This concluded their review of the five leading cases on the always speaking principle, two of which, Burstow and Owens, were resolved by giving the legislation its current meaning, whereas the other three, Royal College of Nursing, Quintaval and FII Globe, were resolved by recasting the legislation, so that it deals with a novelty in a way that the judges considered to be more sensible. See the decision in News Corp. Lords Hamblin and Burroughs held that, although the always speaking principle is at the heart of News Corp's appeal, it is significantly limited by EU law considerations. 105 They then applied Lord Wilberforce's tests from Royal College of Nursing, and concluded that the EU law constraints mean that this is a case in which the always speaking principle falls to be applied at the less liberal end of the scale and that this, together with key differences between printed newspapers and their digital editions, made it clear that they were not within the same genus of facts. Point one zero six. This was the right decision, reached, ultimately, for the right reasons, but, their definition of the always speaking principle, and their review of what they took to be the five leading cases on it, shows that they did not recognize the different issues at stake, and, especially, did not distinguish the meaning and novelty issues. They also declined to endorse Lord Leggett's judgment, which is more attuned to these points, and to which I now turn. 8. News Corp. Lord Leggett's concurrence. Lord Leggett wrote a concurring judgment in News Corp. because, although he agreed with Lords Hamblin and Burroughs as to the result, he considered that important questions of principle are raised, in particular, regarding the so-called always speaking doctrine and interpreting statutes, on which my reasoning does not coincide in all respects with this point 107, and Lord Leggett was fully justified in doing so, as his concurring judgment contains the most valuable judicial exposition of the always speaking notion to date. Lord Leggett traced the always speaking idea back to Coode's work on present tense drafting and noted that it seems ironic that it has itself changed its meaning, and come to be used to express a different idea from the one originally expounded by Coup.108 Lord Leggett, found it unclear how the description of legislation as always, speaking acquired a sense among English lawyers so different from that in which it was originally used, though he added that it may partly reflect the influence of Benyon on statutory interpretation.109, but he implicitly conceded that we are stuck with this mistake, and then sought to limit the phrase always speaking to what he called, apparently interchangeably, ambulatory, dynamic or evolutionary interpretation, i.e. he sought to limit the phrase, to labeling a response to the meaning issue. Point one one zero. Lord Leggett reinforced this by objecting to uses of always speaking to label a response to the novelty issue a case sometimes cited as an authority on the application of the always speaking principle to technological development is Royal College of Nursing. A passage from the speech of Lord Wilberforce, who dissented, was quoted with approval in the Quintaval case and is quoted by Lord Hamblin and Lord Burroughs. That passage seems to me to be a helpful statement of how a court should approach any case where it is necessary to decide whether statutory language applies to a set of facts which its authors did not actually have, or are unlikely to have had or could not have had. It matters not, in contemplation, capital I, do not read it as articulating anything which can usefully be described as an always speaking doctrine.111. Here, Lord Leggett was influenced by the fact that, in Royal College of Nursing, the Lords had reached their conclusion without any mention of any always speaking principle. Point 112, but this is anachronistic, as noted in section 7b, i, the phrase always speaking did not appear in any reported UK case until 1997 and, although Rupert Cross had made a passing reference to the somewhat quaint statement that a statute is always speaking in 1976. It was not used in the UK to label a response to the novelty issue until Bennion's Code emerged in 1984, i.e. three years after the Lords decided the Royal College of Nursing case. Point one one three. 
Lord Leggett also commented on how his version of the always speaking principle, i.e. as a principle of dynamic interpretation, might apply to four different types of change, linguistic changes, changes in social attitudes and values, advance, s, in scientific understanding and technological change. Point one one for these comments, although interesting, go awry in some respects, which, unfortunately, space prevents me from analyzing here. Point one one five. The key points, for present purposes, are that Lord Leggett distinguished three types of principle to which the always speaking label is applied, noted that they respond to different issues, in our terms, the operation, meaning and novelty issues, and then acknowledged that it is important to disentangle these issues, as well as their associated principles. 9. Conclusion. Lord Leggett's analysis is an important step towards clear thinking on these crucial points of statutory interpretation and application. In this article, I have shown how to complete that journey by carefully distinguishing the four types of principle that have come to be associated with the always speaking notion and the four distinct issues that those principles respond to and by showing how they differ and why it is important to disentangle them. Others have noted that our use of the always speaking label has become problematic. For Ian Loveland, the always speaking formula is not a particularly attractive way of framing a principle of dynamic interpretation. Jeffrey Goldsworthy recently called it too ambiguous and potentially sweeping to be useful. And even Lord Stain has recognized that there are at least two strands to this principle. Point 116 Chad Jacobi recently wrote that, notwithstanding that its origin rests in explaining a style of drafting, the expression always speaking has become synonymous with the ambulatory approach to interpretation. It is clear that Kuhn was not seeking to say anything at all about an ambulatory approach. The reason for this transformation in the meaning of the expression is unclear, but it probably no longer matters. 117. I have argued that this transformation is only a part of the story, and it does matter that judges should use the always speaking label correctly. Whether they will do so remains to be seen. Copyright the author, S. 2024. Published by Oxford University Press. This is an open access article distributed under the terms of the Creative Commons Attribution License HTTPS colon slash slash creativeacommons.org slash licenses slash by slash four dot zero slash which permits unrestricted reuse, distribution and reproduction in any medium provided the original work is properly cited. Martin David Kelly, Applying Laws Across Time, Disentangling the Always Speaking Principles, Oxford Journal of Legal Studies, 2024, Key 014, https colon, slash slash doi dot org, slash 10.1093, slash ojls, slash gkey 014.